that is the desire of our heart no matter how long we have been on this journey with you that we have a desire to know you more to know your purpose to know your will to know your your calling on our lives I pray that you would help us to totally and completely surrender Lord I'm afraid that sometimes all we think about is surrendering our heart and we forget to give you our hands God, we want to surrender our, our eternities, but we forget to surrender our daily lives. So I pray today, God, that we surrender to you, that we surrender to your purpose, we surrender to your calling. And I pray today as we open the word of God that you would speak to hearts. Lord, I realize in spending time with you this week that there is something very, very, very important that we have forgot. So God, I'm praying today that you would speak to hearts in a way that I cannot, that you hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ, that people hear you, not me, that they're led of you, not me. And I pray that you are glorified in this service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You guys can be seated. We're continuing with the series, and honestly, I'm not sure if this is going to wrap it up or not, um, but we are continuing in a series called greater than and I don't know about you but we've learned some pretty important stuff so far God is greater than kings and God is greater than politicians amen he's greater than presidents he's greater than governors and senators he is greater than the politicians he's greater than false idols he's greater than fiery trials he's greater than hate 
and jealousy and evil plans against us. He's greater than slavery and jail and lies and false accusations. He is greater than sin. Our God is greater than. And we need to be reminded of that. But I want to be truthful with you. There's something that we need to be reminded of. I think we know it, but we have forgot. And I think it is drastically having an impact on our lives. I think it's having an impact in our community, in our state, in our country. And so my prayer is that God reminds us of something that would seem to be known to all people, but truthfully, I think we have either suppressed it or have forgotten it. And that's what God's going to teach us today. I'm going to start in Luke chapter 8. I'm going to give you a decent amount of scripture today. We didn't print um, sermon notes today, so if you want to take notes, that's fine. And if I go too quick, you can just go back and check it out online. But I'm going to start in Luke chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 40 through 42. I will go over a few more verses after that, but we're going to start with verse 40 to 42 in Luke chapter 8. On the other side of the lake, the crowds, I want you to remember that, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. So here's Jairus. We're introduced to Jairus. He was a leader of the local synagogue, which was a leader of the church. Now here's a question for you. How did the religious leaders feel about Jesus? Did they like him? Did they think positive? We've, we've spent some time. What about the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees and the priests? Did they? Yeah. Is that what I heard? Okay. All right. I like your honesty. All right. I don't know. Nope, that might be in the message. I don't know. That's what they thought of him. Um, they had a very, very, very negative impression. To say that they doubted him would have been an understatement. They despised him. He was a threat to them. But here we're introduced to a man who was a leader of the local church. And we find that he acts in a way that doesn't really fit with how the other religious leaders were treating Jesus. We see here in verse 41 that he fell at the feet of Jesus. Now, you only fell at the feet of people who outranked you. You only fell at the feet of people who were above you in status or in power. And here we see somebody who as a religious leader, by the way, would have been very, very powerful. He'd have been very high on the social scale. But we see him falling at the feet of Jesus Christ. And then he does something that's totally, totally wrong for those people in that position. He begs him. He pleads with him. He begs with him to come to his house. Jesus was from Nazareth. Now, I don't have time to go into the history of this, but they did not think very highly of people from Nazareth. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's what somebody said one time. Y'all remember that? And the King James said, can anything good come from Nazareth? So you think of the worst place that you know of, you know, like that, that place. And I'm not going to mention a name because you might be from there. And, but you with me? Does everybody have a place in mind? It's like, oh, that's the roughest place. That's what they thought about Nazarenes. So here we see the leader of the church who, who doubted Jesus, who despised Jesus, who was threatened at Jesus, and he's kneeling at his feet and then is begging him to come to his house. And all this seems completely out of the norm until you continue to read, and we see why the reason that he did this, his only daughter, 12, was dying. And you know what? When his need was so big, he laid down his status. When his need was bigger than he was, he overlooked his doubt. When his need was bigger than he was, he went to the one that he didn't understand because the need was greater than he was. And my prayer is that people realize that 
We have some needs that are greater than us. And that he got to the point that even though he was beneath him in normal, normal circumstances, he got to the point that he humbled himself because his need was greater than he could handle. My friend, we have got to that place in this state, in this community, in this country. I'm sad to say in the state of Christianity, the needs are greater than we are. We need to humble ourselves and we need to fall at the feet of Jesus and beg him to come and to meet a need. So after this, this lady, this needy lady, had an issue with blood for years, comes and she touches Jesus. Now, I, I want you to think from Jairus' point of view here, okay? He comes to Jairus. I mean, Jairus comes to Jesus and is at his feet and is begging him. And at this point, I feel like Jesus is like, okay, I, I'm coming. We're, we're going to go. We're going to take care of this. And this woman has the nerve enough to come up and to touch Jesus, which now the crowd was everywhere. But Jesus said, who... Who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you kidding? Look at this crowd. Look at this crowd. And you're asking who touched me? And Jesus said, no, no, no. You don't understand. Somebody touched me in faith. Because I felt the power come out of me. You see, there's a big crowd. And a lot of people are bumping. And a lot of people are touching. And a lot of people are curious. But somebody touched me in faith. And when they touched me in faith, I felt my power come out of me. This woman who had a bleeding issue, by the way, you realize she should have been stoned to death? She was considered unclean during um, certain times. I'm trying to, you with me? Please shake your head. I feel like I'm on a ledge right now. Ladies, this was a very um, unfriendly time to be a lady. There was a certain time of the month you were not allowed to be around people. This woman had dealt with an issue of blood for over a decade. And here she found herself in the middle of the crowd. And she's kneeling down just trying to get to the hem of his garment, it says in King James. And so Jesus heals her. And it's a miraculous thing. But I want to get back to Jairus for just a minute. So then in verse 49, while he, or Jesus... While he was speaking to her, the one he had healed, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. And man, as I was reading that this week, I just felt God saying to me, that's the problem right there. That is the problem right there. That is the heart of too many people in this world. They come to Jesus with the need. They come to Jesus with this wish that they want granted. And if they feel like it's too late, the idea is this. There's no need for Jesus. There's no need for Jesus. It's too late. Jairus, I know that you went to him and you were begging and that you humbled yourself. But you see, now your daughter's dead. Now you didn't get what you want. And when you don't get what you want now, there's no reason for Jesus anymore. And my friend, here is the truth. Many, many, many people in this country, that is their idea. If you can't save me from COVID, and if you can't give me a better job, and if you can't pay my bills, and if you can't, you know, heal my loved one, and if these things don't turn out the way that I want them to, then there's no need for Jesus. Unfortunately, that's the heart of many, many people. Well, Jesus heard this, and in verse 50, here's what he says. When Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Parents, does that not sound like a stupid statement? I mean, come on. I mean, I know I love Jesus, but I'm a parent, and I just got told my only daughter has died, and he said, oh, by the way, don't be afraid. And then he continues, just have faith, and she'll be healed. Um, I, just to save some time, I just want to tell you that in verses 51 through 55, that Jesus heals her. Now, there's some very important points that we could focus on here. So when Jesus gets there in verse 40, there's this big crowd. Okay? You with me? There's this big crowd. It talks about when the woman with the issue of blood is there and that she, she kind of 
fights through the crowd and, and then she gets and she, she touches the hem of his garment and, and the disciples have no clue who touched her because of the, the crowd. And then when they're going to Jairus' house and it says that when they got to the house that Jesus told the crowd, you stay outside and we're going to go inside the house. And there could be many teachable points. There could be many sermons. One of the sermons that I could see in this is that there's many, many people who just want to get around Jesus. There's many people that can attend. There's many people who are curious and want to see the circus act. There's many people who might just want to just touch him. I, I, I'm reminded of when Ethan was small and we went to SeaWorld down in Orlando. And, and now this might wig you out, but used to they had animals at SeaWorld. You know what I mean? Animals you could like see and touch, and I'm going to leave that alone right there. But they had this stingray exhibit, and, and he was just a little guy, so we would hold him up over the ledge, and the stingrays would swim around like this. And, and Kenzie would just reach in, and she would pet their backs and try to rub them and all this and that, and Ethan would just do this. <laughs> and sometimes he'd touch them, and sometimes he wouldn't. And they would come, and they'd have to get really close, and you ever been there and they'll flop up against the side of the thing? And Ethan would, and if he touched me, he'd say, got it. <laughs> and they'd swim around and he'd say, he missed that time, he wouldn't say a word. And he'd swim around and he'd say, got it. And Kenji would say, Ethan, just touch him. He said, mm-mm, mm-mm. All he wanted to do was just touch it a little bit from a distance. And, and I, I mean, he was cute, as he was cute as I'll get out. And doing it, but you know what? That's what we do as Christians sometimes. We want to stand back at a distance and, 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 and just get enough so I'm not worried that i got to go to hell or, or, or just get enough so I can get a better job or, or just get enough so I can feel better or just get enough. Got it, got it. And I'm afraid that this was what the crowd was doing. And I can preach on that. I can preach about the fact that there was a multitude around him but only two touched him in faith. And guess what? The two that touched him in faith came out of their changed woman. One was a changed woman. One was a changed man. One young girl went from death to life, not because of what she had done, but because of what her father did. Because her father laid down his pride, and he laid down his position, and he realized that the need was greater than him. And because of that, there became life in his family member. I could preach on that. I can preach on the fact that when we think it's too late, there's no need for Jesus. I can preach on the fact, I can preach on the fact that when the need is greater than you are, that we do things that are out of our normalcy. But that's not what God wants me to focus on. That's not what we have forgotten. And it breaks my heart to think that this is such a, should be such a known fact among followers of Jesus Christ. But here's what we have forgotten, and this is what God's going to have me to focus on, and it's this. God is greater than death. God is greater than death. We see three times in the Old Testament. We see six times in the New Testament. Outside of a group, so technically there were seven in the New Testament, but Individuals, we see three in the Old Testament, six in the New Testament, where God raised them from the dead. And in case you have forgotten, child of God, in case you have forgotten, Christian, I want to remind you of just one of these cases, which is, I think, a pretty important life that we need to remember. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, and if you want to get excited because you know what this is about and you have experienced the difference that this makes in your life, I just want to go ahead and tell you right now I'm giving you freedom, okay? You can go ahead. By the way, y'all acted all kind of Pentecostal last week because Pastor Kyle was here, so I know it's in you. I'm just telling you. I know you a bunch of pretending whatevers. I know we're non-denominational, but I don't care whether you're Baptist or Pentecostal or... Methodist, I don't, whatever it is, this is exciting stuff in Matthew 28, starting in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, 
rolled aside the stone and sat on it in defiance, by the way. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead just as he said he would. Come see where the body was lying and go quickly and tell his disciples. You see, the enemy said, oh, I finally won. Oh, I finally got him where I want him. Oh, it's finally over. And God said, I am greater than death. And you and I need to be reminded that God is greater than death. And the truth is this. The enemy has you in the same place. The enemy has you scared, which by the way, my Bible tells me God's not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And he, the enemy thinks, oh, I got you right where I want you. Oh, it's finally over. And God wants you to be reminded today that he is greater than death and it is never, ever, ever, ever over until God says it is over. Let me remind you of a very powerful, powerful point that will remind you of that in 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. We're going to learn it's not over and it's never too late. 2 Kings 13 verse 20 and 21. Then Elijah died and was buried. That's bad. Right? That's bad. Groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Once when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of these raiders. So they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elijah, of Elisha, sorry, and fled. But as soon as the body touched Elijah's bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet, reckon what he said. <laughs> you ever thought about that? I know that wasn't you, English teachers. I know that wasn't proper. I did that on purpose. I, uh, something happened. See, so, so, something happened here. He went from death to life. They thought it was over. The family was gone. They were mourning, and they thought it was too late the enemy thought it is over with Jesus but God wants to remind you he is greater than death and we need to remember that we are walking around enslaved to fear because we have forgotten that God is greater than death we need to be reminded of that now although we see nine times in scripture Nine times in Scripture where individuals are raised from the dead. Three in the Old Testament, six in the New Testament. Hasn't happened for 2,000 years. And now, I don't claim to be the greatest at mathematics, but if you take nine and divide it into multiple billions, it equals um, zero percent. Well, I was excited. And now that sounds bad. And here's the truth. Outside of the rapture, outside of the rapture, you and I are going to die. And you know what? A wonderful, wonderful sister in Christ reminded me after first service, Miss Monica, who is a brilliant mind, by the way, she said, hey, by the way, you know those nine that were raised from the dead? They died. Here's the truth. Listen to me. Outside of the rapture, you and I are going to die. Now, it's good to know God has the power to raise us from the dead. Amen? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he still has that power. But here's the truth. And, and I felt like God wanted me to share this with you. I don't think he's going to do that in your life. I don't think he's going to do that in my life. And in the midst of that, 
in the midst of the fact that nobody has raised from the dead in 2,000 years, God wants to remind you that He is still greater than death. And we cannot run around and forget that. You see, here's the truth. Nobody wants to die. I mean, very, very few people want to die. We don't want other people's to other people's other people to die. But and, and man, this is good right here. And I'm gonna say it several times because I want you to get it. And even though I wrote it, this is good. We cannot be such a slave to fear that we forget to live. We cannot be such a slave to fear that we forget to live. Here's the brutal truth. We forgot to live. Here's the brutal truth. I think a lot of us were like that Israelite who had died. A lot of us were like Jesus on Friday and Saturday. I feel like our hope has died. I feel like our, our worship has died. I feel like that for a lot of God's people, that, that our willingness to dream big spiritual dreams has died. Our willingness to serve God and to serve other people, that has died. The joy of our walk, the joy of our salvation has died. But God wants you to know that it is never too late. It is never too late and God is greater than death. Your joy might be gone, but He's greater than death. He can bring it back to life. Your ability to dream big spiritual dreams might be squashed because of all the crap that's going on. And God wants you to know that He can bring and He can revive those things again. Life is found. Life is found in who God is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. You can do whatever you want to, but if you don't have life in Jesus Christ, you don't have life. Our life is found. Our life is identified in Jesus Christ. It's not identified in presidents. It sure as heck is not identified in governors or in, in presidential races, or in Senate races. Those are important. It's not found in the federal government. It's not found in stimulus money. It's not found in masks. It's not found in social distance. Our life is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. God is greater than death, and you and I need to be reminded of that because we have forgot. And we're walking around so scared of offending. We're walking around so scared of this and so scared of that that we have forgot to live the life that we have in Jesus Christ. A victorious life. We're so focused on these bodies. We're so focused on the temporary that we have forgot the eternal. God's Word tells me that it's better off for me to pull an eye out of my head and to go to heaven with one eye than to split hell wide open with two. I think he wants us to remember that these bodies are not as important as the spiritual things he has entrusted to us. Our life is in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 said that he broke the power of death. He broke the power of death. And I was preaching for a service and I said, I wish I had something. And you know what? A bunch of students went out after service and they got me something. And I want you to get this picture. This represents death. And I ought to whoop one of you with it all up and down. <coughs> Why is everybody looking at you? Her, um, her. I want you to get this picture, okay? This is death. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. And he, Jesus Christ, broke the power 
of death. And he illuminated. He illuminated. He showed the way to life and immortality. Did, did you hear that? He broke the power of death. Here, there's your souvenir. All right, good catch. See there? That's a baseball mom. She can catch right there. She's watched many practices. He broke the power of death. Okay, maybe next time if I throw Twinkies, y'all will catch it. I did that one time. Were y'all here when I stuck a Reese cup on the end of a fishing pole? Huh? Yeah. You're like, yeah, I remember that. Do that one again. <laughs> here's, here's what I want you to get. He broke, he broke the power of sin. And then he illuminated the way to life. I'm telling you right now, outside of Jesus, you have no life. You can do this and you can do that. And outside of Jesus, you have no life. And it said that he illuminated life. But you know what it goes on to say? And immortality. I heard a story. I don't know if it's true or not. I heard a story that Walt Disney paid huge amounts of money for them to freeze him. So if they figured out a cure for whatever killed him, they could bring him back to life. People are so concerned with living forever, with living forever, with living forever, that we get so fearful of death that we forget to live. And Jesus broke the power. Some of y'all are nervous. I'm going to throw this. Because like, if I don't catch it, he's going to fuss at me. He broke the power of death. And he illuminated the way to life and immortality through the, the good news. Can you see where that's good news? That he broke the power of death. That he gave us a way. He showed a way. He shined the light on life and immortality. You see, here's the deal. People are so scared to live right now. They're so scared to live right now that they're running around doing this and they're running around doing that, hoping they're going to have immortality. And the truth is everybody's going to die. Even if Jesus raises you from the dead, you're still going to die after that. But my Bible tells me that there is a way to immortality. And it's through Jesus Christ. Let me share some verses with you in, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, who wants a stick? Y'all want a stick? Look, oh, good block, Marty. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Pass interference. Yes. Oh, easy. Everybody focus on Cole. 1 Corinthians 15. I, mm -mm. I mm, caught mine. Is that a good? Huh? Listen, I'm a Christian. I don't lie. I kid anyway. By the way, my brother said, that ain't fair. You can't get by with that. Well, it's worked so far. All right. First, first Corinthians chapter 15. I just want to bring several of these verses to light here. Um, this is a great chapter, but I'm not going to take the time to read it all. But 1 Corinthians 15, 19, there is such an unbelievably powerfully good point here. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Let me read that again. Because that should be penetrating your spirit right now. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. If your only hope in Jesus is for what He can do for you here and now, you're to be pitied. If the only thing you think Jesus can do for you is make you not feel guilty, to make you not worry about going to hell, if the only thing you think Jesus can do for you is to keep you from getting a disease or a sickness or to heal a sick loved one or to give you a better job or to pay your bills, if your only hope in Jesus is in this life, you are to be pitied. 
because Jesus is much, 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 much bigger than that. Can he help you with those things? Yes. Will he? I'm not sure. He might, he might not. I mean, I, things are different. Here's what you need to know. His priorities for your life is not about just this earth. His priority for your life is about affecting your eternity and the eternity of other people. And you and I need to be reminded of the fact that our hope in Christ is much more than just this life. I've got good news for you. It goes on here in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15. And it says, And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. I like that. You, you ever seen these movies or these books? And, and even, if you're, even if you're in a battle, you know what you do? You save the best for last, right? You with me? You're in a battle. You're in a playoff. You, those of you in sports, you, you want the best last, right? You want that build up. And you know what I love? Jesus Christ says, oh, I done, I done conquered kings. I done conquered priests. I conquered the church. I conquered uh, hate and envy and jealousy and, and false accusations. And I've, I've done conquered prison. But you know what? I'm holding one for the very end. You see, this one, when I conquer this one, when I defeat this one, then my people are going to know that there's hope. When I conquer this one, people are going to get excited. When I conquer this one, it's going to change some people's lives. And the thing that I'm saving for last, that last enemy that I'm going to conquer, that last butt that I'm going to kick is death. And you and I have forgotten running around so scared of dying that we forgot to live. The Bible goes on in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 and 55 and 56 to say this. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, Where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. God wants you to know He conquered sin and He conquered death. And you and I need to be unmovable. And when the enemy throws this and it throws that, we need to stay firmly planted in the fact that our life is in Christ. It's not in this political party. It's not in this political race. It's not in this federal government or this state government or popular opinion or what these yahoos on social media think. Our life is found in Christ. And when popular opinion says this, I am going to be immovable. And when this entity says that, I am not going to be moved. Why? Because God is greater than death. And you and I need to remember that. I want to share with you one other verse of scripture and then we're going to celebrate is that okay with y'all hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 because god's children are human beings made of flesh and blood the son also became flesh and blood you realize that's why i did it right the son also became flesh and blood For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Past tense, you with me? He does not have, present tense. He had, past tense, the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way, Could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying? And here's the truth. There are many 
many, many 